Hey everyone, week three of Advent is here. Third candle on the Advent wreath, it's the pink one. Do y'all know what it is? It's joy! Woo! Jesus is almost here! We are so close. It's so awesome to be able to continue to celebrate, to build up in anticipation. And in getting ready for today, reading Luke chapter 1, reading the birth story in Luke chapter 2, just trying to get a feel, what should we talk about as we celebrate the joy that is coming as Jesus enters our world for the first time? And, and as I was trying to think through that question, different events in my life started popping up. And I wonder if some of the same ones pop up in your mind. You know, because what are the most joyful moments you can think of? For some of us, maybe it's a graduation, whether our own or one of our kids or one of our nieces, nephews, grandkids, whatever it is. For some of us, maybe it's when we bought our first house or our first car. For some of us, maybe it's when we got married. For some of us, maybe it's when our first child was born. I remember for us, uh, when we knew Charlie was coming, you know, we'd spent the last several months kind of getting ready, having different things, getting all the sort of stuff we thought we would need, registering for, for baby stuff here and there. But the month of September, man, the anticipation, whew, it was getting us. Day after day, week after week, month after month, it was just bigger and bigger, growing and growing. It was, it was exciting. You know, I was getting tingly. I was like, every day, anytime Liz would be like, man, I don't feel so good. Oh, is it time to go to the hospital? I was just, I was on it. I was so ready. I was wired. And the day she came, whew, man, I'd, I'd like to say I think we were ready. Okay, because she came right on time. It was about 11.30 p.m. on September 24th. Okay, and she's due on the 25th. So, timely baby. That's what I'm talking about. So, 11.30 on the 24th, Liz comes out of the bathroom. And she's got kind of a strange look on her face. I think my water just broke. It's like, whoo, adrenaline took over there. We're about to go to the hospital. Let's get this done. So, <coughs> excuse me. We pack up our stuff. We get Liz in the car. We make a call to make sure that someone's coming over to watch Captain. So that way he's going to be okay. You know, he's, he's stressed too. And we get to the hospital about midnight. We check in. We're in our room. And y'all, you'd think, man, we're probably just going to be so excited, right? No, we are worried. We are stressed because so many different things can happen. And to be honest with you, we got in there and we thought, okay, we're here for the night. They did some little test thing and the nurse told us, well, you're really not ready to give birth yet. And it's like, are you kidding? Like, she's been having contractions the whole way over here. What do you mean she's not ready to give birth yet? They almost sent us home, y'all. All right. Nope, we were not. It's like, no, we're staying. We would like to be here. Thank you. Um, that nurse did not come back. But every five minutes, a different nurse came into the room and like the stress for us, it was real. And I'm sure Liz had a little more stress than I did. You know, she was a little more uncomfortable than I was. But that night, it was just tossing and turning. The, the stress versus the excitement. The, the anticipation versus the, the worry. But y'all, then she came. Then she came in to the world. The unknown about what was going to come in the future, it just seemed to melt away. And you know, I don't know how long Liz was pushing for. I'm sure she can remember. Um, maybe not. I don't know. But... At 9.33 a.m., there she is, sweet little Charlie Rose, all six pounds, 10 ounces of her. I remember the, the first time seeing her, whether it was holding her or, or putting her down, didn't matter. The first time just looking into that little face, I was trying to hold back tears because, you know, I'm a man, I'm tough, all right, and I was failing miserably. I was so happy. Looking down at Liz, the mother of my child, I was just I was so happy. As Charlie emerged all right, the song, we, they told us we could connect Spotify to the speakers in the room, which was super cool. The song that was playing was Victory Is Yours by Bethel, a perfect song for this little girl to come out. It was a powerful moment. We were filled with joy, filled with happiness. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, getting tingly just thinking about it. It was like nothing we'd ever experienced. It was incredible. So what are those moments for you? Is it walking into the reception hall after you got married? You know, maybe it's, it's watching your bride walk down the aisle. Maybe it's you're at a graduation and you're watching your, your, your great niece walk across that stage. You know, just being the first one to graduate from college or something like that. Whatever it is, you know, those moments are so powerful. But even more than that, it's the anticipation that makes those moments even sweeter. It makes it even better because we continue to think, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? It's excitement versus stress. It's worry versus, ex versus just what's coming. But the anticipation is what continues to just help us see something awesome is coming. 
And sometimes, you know, when it finally comes true, it lets us down. But when it comes to God, the payoff is just that much sweeter. When this awesome, incredible, life-changing moment comes, it's something else. It just gets me excited just thinking about it. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the joy, the moment that it comes, but also the anticipation that builds up to that moment. And to help us do that, we're going to look at three couples in Scripture, three couples that will help us to just kind of encapsulate what it must have been like for Mary and Joseph, for all of Israel as they they saw that their Savior had come, whether they rejected him or not, but then also for us as we look forward to when Jesus makes his next debut. And so as we start to look at these couples, what better place to start than in the beginning in the book of Genesis? Our first couple today are Abraham and Sarah, and their son would be Isaac. So you got Abraham and Sarah, and they're they're a pretty interesting couple in the Old Testament, okay? Because Abraham is the father of many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and, and so are you. But before we praise the Lord, let me give you a little bit of background on this couple here. So Abraham and Sarah had been promised that they would be the future ancestors of an entire nation. Okay, Israel didn't exist at this point, but it was about to. And Abraham and Sarah were supposed to be the ancestors of that entire nation of Israel. God had promised Abraham, look at the stars. Can you count them? That's how many descendants you're going to have. Like, insane! So many people! But it hadn't come yet. They were, they were starting to feel a little like, oh, maybe we're a little too far over the hill. And if you look at the reality of their situation, they're not just kind of over the hill. They are on the other side, down into the valley and a ways into it. All right. When, when Isaac comes, Abraham is about 100 years old. Okay, So he's 99 when this, when this baby gets started. So it's, they're very old. And Scripture points it out. Scripture actually says they're well along in years. Okay, They are old. But then when we look at chapter 18, God doesn't see it as a, as a stumbling block. God doesn't see it as an obstacle. Something amazing happens. You see, it says that Abraham is in the presence of the Lord. And then out of nowhere, three guys show up. Okay? It's not like they walked up. They're just, they weren't there and now they're there. Abraham sees them and something inside of him says, Hey, I got to get these guys some food. I got to get these guys something to drink. I got to get these guys a place to rest. And so he does. He brings them into his tent. He hangs out. He's waiting there with them. And then one of them says, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Whoo! Awesome sauce right there. How cool is that? These people who were promised to be the parents of an entire nation were finally about to have their first kiddo. But what was Sarah's response? Take a look at verse 11. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Sarah laughed. She laughed at what God just said he was going to do. She laughed at this messenger from God saying, hey, you're going to have your first kid. Sarah's like, oh, ha, 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 No, I'm not. Okay. And then on top of that, when called out on it, what'd she do? She lied. She's like, nope, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. We heard you. And it's God. All right. All, always present, all knowing, can do all things. He knows you just lied. Accept it. All right, own up. What the heck? And as you hear this, my first thought, I'll be honest with you. So not only did she doubt, she lied about doubting. All right. Well, Sarah, we tried. We're going to move on. We're going to work through Hagar and, uh, and Ishmael. They'll be the nations. You, you lost your chance. You think, right? She failed. So obviously she shouldn't get this anymore. But... God loves us so much. He pushes through our doubts. He pushes through our lies. He pushes through our junk. And the promise that that this baby was coming is fulfilled. But until that time, we get two full chapters of stuff. All right? It's some weird stuff that goes on. So these men leave. Okay? They've just announced, Sarah, you're going to have a baby. Super cool. We know you're old. Doesn't matter. All things are possible with God. Stop thinking he can't do it. So... 
After that, Sodom and Gomorrah gets destroyed, all right? And that's a weird story in and of itself. So that sort of thing happens. Then Abraham and Sarah get kind of messed up with this king Abimelech. They go into his kingdom and Abraham's like, well, Sarah's super pretty. I don't want this king to kill me. So I'm just gonna say Sarah's my sister. Why? Why would you do that? All right, so he's lying. That's a problem. Bad stuff happens in the kingdom. And in the end, the kingdom's like, why didn't you just be honest with us? They leave everything, like they're probably not friends anymore. But that happens. Then we get a little bit of a weird story with Lot and his daughters. We don't need to go into that today. But all this weird sort of stuff is happening. And through it all, there's no mention of this future promise. But then immediately in chapter 21, the promise is fulfilled. So what I have to believe is happening through all this junk, through all this stress, through all this sort of stuff no one expected, through all this weird stuff that was going on, through all this destruction, through all this, this kind of messed up, odd sort of things, the anticipation, the thought of God's promise was continuing to just noodle around in Abraham and Sarah's mind. The anticipation was building. They couldn't wait for, for the coming of their new little baby in their lives. And like I said in chapter 21, a year later, to the day, here he comes. Take a look. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The promise has been fulfilled. She has her baby boy. Her joy is complete. You can see it in her words. She's so excited. She's laughing about the fact that she laughed. And she's just, she's so, so joy filled. God came through. So that's couple one. Now let's look at couple two. Zechariah and Elizabeth. So these are another pretty cool, cool couple. Okay? They kind of transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, sort of different things that are going in there. But Zechariah and Elizabeth are, are, are very faithful, devout followers of the Most High God. But similar to Sarah, Elizabeth had not conceived. And actually it says Elizabeth was barren. And then it also says Elizabeth was old. Like, if Scripture says you're old, just accept you're old, okay? Like, Scripture has no superfluous information. It is all necessary. It is all in there. And if it says you're old, you're old because God's glory is about to come through. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, check out what's going on here. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Herod. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. There it is again, very old. They're old people. Elizabeth can't conceive, barren and old. There was no expectation that a child was coming. All right, it's not like they were thinking, well, God promised. He didn't. They had just accepted this is not what's going on. They were living their lives serving God. There's nothing wrong with that. But then an angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah. Take a look, verse 13. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You are going to have a son. That's the basic message of what this angel just brought. Woo! They're so excited about that because to have a son was such a great joy back then. It was so significant. It was so cool. They were so amped up. Right? Well, like Sarah kind of doubted, so did Zechariah. Take a look at verse 18. Zechariah then asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Again, addressing the fact that they are old. 
All right. And this angel here, he just brought this super cool message from God. And what is the first response in our human logical minds? You sure? It's God. Trust God. God is God. You are not. Let's let him do his thing. But Zechariah questions. And again, risking that idea of God being fine. I'm going to go somewhere else. But God doesn't do that. God loves Zechariah through it. God does give Zechariah a little bit of a challenge to deal with, though. Because what happens next is the angel says, okay, well, until this son that you don't think God is, is capable of making, uh, until this son comes, you don't get to talk anymore, all right? His lips are closed. His tongue is, is shackled or, or chained or imprisoned, whatever you want to call it. He is not able to speak until the day that John is born and the name John is given. And the angel's just telling him, so for right now, just be silent. But even the forced silence, it can't contain the anticipation that is building. It can't stop the hope that is growing. It can't stifle the excitement that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more. They're so excited about it. We're going to see that in just a minute. But when the time came, y'all, when the time came, verse 57, here it comes. When it was time for Elizabeth to have their baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. This is the first instance we get in our, in our message for today where joy is contagious. It spreads the joy of what the Lord has done, the miracles that he has done, his work, his goodness, his hope and future that he has given to us in his plans. It, it's spreading. People are excited about what's happening because our God is great and he's showing it to us. The neighbors, their relatives, they were all caught up in the joy that Elizabeth was exuding because she was about to have a son. People were amped up. And when it came time to name him, there was a little bit of debate there. You know, these neighbors and relatives were like, well, Zachariah's a cool guy. Let's name your baby Zachariah after him. Elizabeth's like, no, no, I want to name him John. And they're like, no one in your family is named John. That's not a good call. All right, name him Zechariah. And they go back and forth, back and forth, because Zechariah right now can't talk. They have to name him John in order for him to be able to talk. And so they're going back and forth, deciding what to do. They're going back and forth. Elizabeth's trying her best, but in that culture, a man's word is greater than a woman. So I'm sure one of their relatives was a man, and he was just saying, no, you should name him Zechariah. But Elizabeth's like, no, it should be John. And then finally, Zechariah acts in verse 63. Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Definitive final. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free. And what did he do? He began to speak praising God. The first thing Zechariah did, being swept up in the joy of having a son, is he praised God. His son was born. His mouth was open. God came through. God's promises were fulfilled. Both Elizabeth and Zechariah's joy was complete. And you see it in the next 20 verses as it records Zechariah's song, praising the one true God. So that's couple number two. And let's take a look at couple number three. And I bet you had a guess at who it was going to be. All right, it's Christmas season, so we got to talk about Mary and Joseph, whose son would later be Jesus. So Mary and Joseph are arguably the most normal couple, um, at least to start. Okay, there's, there's nothing wrong with either of them. Mary's in her mid to early teens. Joseph's a little bit er, older and they had been promised to each other. They've been betrothed. No one's barren. No one's old. No one's thinking, man, I really wish we'd have a kid now. Like they're just living their lives. They're having the best time. And then an angel appears and they're no longer the normal couple we expected. Verse 28, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at the angel's words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This little unsuspecting teenage girl 
just found out she's not only about to, to conceive a child, she is about to conceive the savior of all of creation. And Joseph, her fiance, surely he's going to be on board with this, right? Take a look at Matthew chapter 1. Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph was not a fan. He doubted the validity of what was happening, which in all reality, he had every right to do in that day. You were promised to this girl. She was promised to you. There was a, a contract, a legal obligation to what was going on. And for her to be discovered to be pregnant, he had every right to just walk away. And that was his plan. He wasn't going to be ugly about it, but he was going to leave her. And I'm sure God would have had a plan. But what God did instead is God sent that same angel to Joseph in a dream, helped fill in some of the blanks and helped show Joseph, no, no, I need you here. So Joseph gets on board. And the anticipation begins. Not only are they about to just have a child, they're about to have the Savior of all creation. It's exciting. And so day after day, week after week, month after month, they're preparing. And it wasn't just Mary and Joseph. Because remember, the joy that they're experiencing, that's building, the anticipation of that joy that is coming, it's contagious. It's something they can't contain to themselves. And it spreads to Elizabeth and Zechariah when they come in our reading today to visit. Take a look again. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Elizabeth was filled with joy. John the Baptist, while in the womb, was filled with joy. All right, take that with you if babies can't hear anything in the womb. They can. All right, they feel it. They hear it. They know it. And John the Baptist was so excited. His, his little cousin Jesus had just come to visit. and He was amped. He was excited. He was jumping in the womb. And that's what joy does. It's contagious. It spreads. It fills in all the cracks. It gets us all so excited about what's coming. It's all over the place. And the anticipation of the birth of the Savior was coming closer and closer. No one could handle it. It was so cool. And we'll get a little deeper into that birth in the next coming weeks. But, but no, baby Jesus came. Baby Jesus made his debut in all of his glory and majesty and all of the joy that he brought to the world. And that's what this week is all about. The joy that entered this world 2,000 years ago. A joy that is contagious. A joy that spreads. A joy that we have the calling to share with as many people as possible. All right? You don't got to wear a mask to share joy. But you should to not spread coronavirus. But we're also celebrating the joy that is coming. Because although we got a glimpse of that joy in the birth of Jesus, we get a glimpse of that joy in the different things that are happening around us, those graduations, those marriages, those births, all those awesome sort of things, those rites of passages that happen all around us. We're in a position of anticipation, a petition or a position of buildup, where we're looking forward to our eternal joy that is coming when Christ returns again. Because that baby, that baby boy Jesus, he grew day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, sharing his, his wisdom and peace and mercy and grace and love and hope and joy. He lived a perfect, blameless, sinless, righteous life. And he took that perfect, blameless, sinless, righteous life and he sacrificed it on the cross for us in order to give us a hope and a future filled with peace, filled with love, and filled with joy. A joy that is unending. A joy that is unspeakable. A joy that will consume our every inclination. And y'all, when we look at that joy and we look at our lives and we kind of 
put ourselves up against it. We don't deserve it. We are so like these couples we talked, we, we talked about today. You know, we laugh at God's plan. We doubt God's will. We question God's direction in our lives because we think, well, this would be so much easier, but God didn't call you into the ministry. God didn't call you into the army that he is creating for himself in order to tell you, oh, by the way, it's going to be super easy till I come back. No, if you look at scripture, it's going to be hard. And we doubt God's plan for our lives. But just like Sarah's laughter, just like Zechariah's questioning, just like Joseph's doubt didn't disqualify them from being a part of the promised joy that God had given to them, our doubt, our laughter, our brokenness, our sin, our everything we do wrong doesn't disqualify us from an eternity in heaven, an eternity with God, an eternity of joy. Because of what Christ did, we know that when we fail, we're forgiven. We're covered in His grace. And just like we wait for the debut of a sweet little baby in either our lives, our friends' lives, our family's lives, something like that, as we await for these awesome moments of joy to be popping up here and there in different sort of situations that we see, we're also waiting on Jesus to make His next debut. We wait on Jesus to come and to take us back home. We wait on Jesus to bring us into the perfect, unending, unspeakable joy that he alone provides. We wait. Anticipation building, hope expanding, excitement growing. Day after day, week after week, month after month, we wait on joy. Amen.